Y'all are going to have to bear with me because I'm not very good at holding one of these and speaking consistently. There's a reason that I attach it to my face. So uh, if, if you miss a few uh, words as I move out of my, I apologize. I'll, I'll try to do better. Uh, we've been in the midst of a series. It's just called Uncommon. And we're talking about how a believer in Jesus Christ ought to ultimately live. That the lives that we lead, the way that we conduct ourselves in this world ought to be something unique. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, he, he told Timothy, the young uh, mentee of his, he said, hey Timothy, among the believers, you should set an example in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. That this ought to be something that everyone else could look to, that they would be uh, admiring of, and ultimately they would strive to attain to as well. If we are the people of God, we ought to represent Jesus Christ well in this world. And so we should strive to those things as well, that we would live a life that is worthy of imitation. So last week we talked about our speech. It should always be absolutely true and always spoken in love. And that will be unique. That will be uncommon in this world in which we live. Now this week we're going to talk specifically about our conduct. But before we do that, um, I want to I share with you a, a brief summary of an Old Testament prophet. You may have heard of the Old Testament prophet Hosea. He was a unique prophet in that he didn't, like a prophet is a spokesperson on behalf of God. And Hosea didn't just do that with his lips, but he also did it with his life. And so here's how it goes. If you've ever read uh, Hosea, God comes to Hosea and he says, Hosea, I want you to go marry a woman of harlotry. That means she was a prostitute. Hosea, I want you to go and find a prostitute. I want you to marry her. I want you to love her. I want you to make her your wife. And I want you to have children with her. And so Hosea, in obedience to God, he goes and finds a woman named Gomer. She was indeed a prostitute. And he did indeed have children uh, of prostitution with her. There's some question as to whether these were really his own children. You see, Gomer was unfaithful to Hosea. She chased after other lovers. She wandered from his house. At one point, she even abandons him. One of the children that she has with Hosea while his wife, they actually, the, the child's name is not mine. Not my people, like maybe the child didn't even belong to Hosea. And so Gomer ends up leaving their marriage. She chases after other lovers. She goes back to her old way of life, is doing her own thing. And things go badly for her. We're not sure how she fell so, so low, but in a minute we're going to see that uh, Gomer is being sold at an auction to the highest bitter. But before that, Hosea, probably contemplating losing his wife, watching his marriage fall apart, um, it, he had every reason for divorce. I mean, she'd abandoned the marriage, proven she wasn't following after God, clearly. And she committed adultery multiple, multiple times against him. But rather than divorcing his wife, God comes to Hosea and he said, I want you to go and get her. So in the next scene, we see this auction happening. This was an 8th century thing, uh, 8th century BC, that would take place where um, when you fell to a certain social status, maybe you were indebted to somebody, maybe you'd gotten in trouble in some way, um, you would be sold at a public auction. And so here is Gomer at a public auction. Hosea finds her there. It's likely that she's been stripped naked because if you're going to buy a prostitute, you want to know what you're getting. So she's standing before all these people, naked, in her shame. It's likely that she would have covered her face so that she wouldn't have to endure the hostility of the crowd, the jeering. And so the bidding begins. One shekel, two shekels, four shekels, five shekels. And then as Hosea stands there, or I'm sorry, as Gomer stands there, she hears a familiar voice. Six shekels, seven shekels, eight shekels, that familiar voice again. And as she looks up, she probably opens her eyes and begins to scan the crowd, and she saw a familiar face. And it was the face of her husband, Hosea, who had come to get his wife again. Ten shekels, twelve shekels, fourteen, fifteen shekels, and a homer of barley, and Hosea had bought his wife back. And he didn't buy her back as a servant 
or a slave. He brought her back as a wife. And he said, I'm going to belong to you, and you're going to belong to me. Like, I'm going to be your husband, and you're going to be my wife once again. Even though you've chased after other lovers, you've been unfaithful, you've committed all of these sins against me and against our marriage and our family, he brought her home to dwell with her once again. And so I told you that Hosea wasn't just a prophet with his lips. He was also a prophet with his life. And so here's what's going on. God was speaking through the prophet Hosea to tell us about about who he is and how he relates to his people. And so if you're just paying attention to the story, you'll know that we, as the people of God, we're like Gomer. We're his people, but we've often gone astray. And we've chased after other idols. We've chased after false gods. We give ourselves to things that aren't God. We're not faithful to him in any way. And yet our God is a God who at great cost to himself, even though we were separated from him, he bought us back. And he brought us back to be his people. We serve a God who leaves the 99 and chases after the one. And he goes and he searches for that one. And when he finds it, he brings it home. And he celebrates that one of his lost sheep has been brought home. You see, Hosea was a prophet not only with his lips, but also with his life. Can I submit to you that we as the people of God, we're like Gomer. But we're also like Hosea. That God has called us, whom we, have, we are the lost sheep who have been found. We are the unfaithful spouse who has been brought home. That God has called us to declare the goodness of God to this world, not only with our lips, but also with our lives. That in the way that we conduct ourselves as the people of God in this world, we would speak and we would shout and we would declare the goodness of And the faithfulness of our God, that he is a God who does indeed lead the 99 and chase after the one. And so today I want to talk to you about the conduct of a believer in Jesus Christ, of someone who would call them a part of his church, who would say, I am of the bride of Christ. And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, that's kind of where we're going to be for just a little bit. But before we, we get there, I want to share with you a verse that kind of encapsulates what we're going to be talking about today. And it's 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, he says, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And so we once were separated from God. And through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, through sending his son to die in our place, to bear our punishment, to pay the penalty for our sin, God has reconciled us to himself. He's brought us home. He's made us his children. We are now the people of God once again. But the verse goes on. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of of reconciliation. That as God has done to us, that's what we're supposed to do for other people. That as God has found us in our sin and in our brokenness, in our shame, and our unfaithfulness, in our adultery, whatever that might be, whatever your story would be, in the same way that God sent Jesus Christ that you might be reconciled back to him, so we would be given the ministry of reconciliation where we give ourselves up on behalf of our fellow men and women, our neighbors, our family members, in order to help draw them back to Christ. We have been given this ministry of reconciliation. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, when we think about our conduct, how how should we live as believers? Because this could be a long list, right? I mean, you think about how am I supposed to be a parent or a, a spouse or a single person or employee? Like the categories for our conduct, it is so broad I could not begin to name them all. But Paul simplifies that for the church at Ephesus. And he tells us how we are to conduct ourselves in this world. And he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Paul says, do you remember how God has loved you? Do you remember his grace and his mercy? Do you remember his forgiveness? 
Do you remember the long suffering that God has shown to you that though you were unfaithful for day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that God continued to love you and to pursue you, that he was long suffering and patient with you? Do you remember how God pursued your heart and lavished his grace and mercy on you, even though you had sinned against him more times than we could count? Paul's like, imitate that. When you conduct yourselves toward other people in this world, when the people of God, us as believers in Jesus Christ, when we conduct ourselves in this world, we should do to others as Christ has done for us. That even at great personal cost to ourselves, that we would extend and reflect the love of God toward other people. As beloved children, so shall we love. So Paul says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. At any time, we would give ourselves up for another person in the same way that Jesus gave himself up for us. You know what that is? It's worship. It's pleasing to God. Any time that we would offer ourselves on behalf of our fellow man, on behalf of our neighbor, on behalf of that person who's hurting, who's in need, man, not only is it a blessing to them, but it's an offering of worship to God, a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so our uncommon conduct that we're going to talk about today, it ought to be, it ought to flow out of what God has given to us it ought to flow, flow from what God has placed into our hearts, which is ultimately love. We do because God has done for us. And so um, four things that I want you to see about uncommon conduct today, things that we can look at uh, to tangibly. I, again, I can't begin to speak to them all. But the first thing I want to talk to you about today is uncommon service. Verse 2 says, Walk in love just as Christ also loved you you and gave himself up for us. You remember Philippians 2 where Paul's writing the church at Philippi and he says, hey, like don't live these selfish lives that are really all about you looking out only for your own interests, but instead you should have the attitude of Christ who although he was God, he didn't cling to his equality with God, but instead he humbled himself and he became the bondservant of all. He was a bondservant who was obedient, even unto death on a cross. And so Paul says, be imitators of God. When you think about your conduct toward those who are in the church and those who are outside of the church, you should be an imitator of Christ. And the position that, that puts all of us in, if you claim faith in Jesus Christ, and this isn't like every now and then, but this is our whole lives, we should see ourselves as bondservants of Jesus Christ and of our neighbor and of our frustrating coworker. Like we should live lives of uncommon service. If the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords came and became the bondservant of all, who was obedient and serving even unto death, then that's what we should do too. Uncommon conduct begins with uncommon service to our fellow man. That means we serve our husband or our wife even when they're not serving us back. You know what I mean? Because I'm kind of a guy who, y'all know the chips in the bank theory? You know, where, where basically you, you'll, you serve somebody and you gain some chips in the bank, and because you have chips in the bank, then you can cash them in sometimes, which means they should serve you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It doesn't matter. It's what I do. It's what I think with people. If I've done something for you, I expect something in return. Like, not like that's the only reason I did it, but it's just kind of be on par with people. We expect to get it in return. But Jesus is like, no, 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 no. This is not exactly how you live. You, you got the serving part right. It's the expectation of service in return that you got wrong. Because Jesus Christ, he offered himself for us. He became a bond servant in this world, knowing that the only thing we could bring to the table was sin. Like we don't give anything back in return. And so we are imitators of God toward our fellow man. 
And we serve each other tirelessly, giving ourselves to one another. We share our time and our energy and our talents and our treasure, expecting nothing in return. And I promise you that that is uncommon in this world that's going to tell you over and over and over, hey, you do you. And you focus on you. You live your best life while you're here. You be the best. Like, you just go get it for you. Think about you and your family and really don't worry about anybody else. And what's uncommon in this world are men and women who would become servants of all and expect nothing in return. If our conduct is going to be outstanding, worthy of imitation, admirable among our culture. We've got to be imitators of God and become ultimately uncommon in the way that we serve one another. The second thing, and is going to go, basically, when you think about loving people, giving yourself up for people, and that's, that's, that means you're going to be sacrificial in the way that you live your life. That means that you will not have as many things as you otherwise could have because you're giving to people who have less than you do. That means that you're not going to get to enjoy your hobbies to the fullest extent because you're sacrificing something that you have for someone that you love more. We give up our money and our time and our energy and our presence. We do that as an act of love for our fellow man, as an act of worship to God. We conduct ourselves as Jesus would conduct himself if he were living our lives. And so it ought to be something that's ultimately sacrificial. Now, Paul is going to turn here, and he's not going to tell us all the ways that that might manifest in our lives. Like, we should meditate on that. Like, God, what would it look like for me to be a servant as you were a servant? And, and the context for that are, you know, difference in a, a hundred different ways here among our body. And so we should meditate on that. But Paul is going to say, he's going to point out a few specific ways that if we're going to conduct ourselves, we're going to be imitators of Christ, some very specific ways that that won't go. As we seek to be spokespeople for Jesus Christ, to tell the story of his goodness to our world, there ought to be some ways that we stand out. And in some of those, he's going to point out here, um, they're going to be like things that we would ultimately avoid. And so the first one he talks about here in verse 3 says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, is as proper among the saints. Among the saints, people who call themselves children of God, these things should be as far as they can be from you. Like they shouldn't even be named among you. There shouldn't even be a hint of this in your midst. If you are the people of God, being imitators of Christ, these things do not belong. And so he starts with immorality. And now just to put the cards on the table for you, this is the Greek word porneia. What he's talking about here is sexual immorality. And y'all, I don't know that there's a more timely word for our culture, which says, do what feels good. If you desire it, chase after it. Like, whatever you want to do, whatever feels good, to you, just go get that thing. And even to think that somehow we are oppressed if we don't get to fully express our every desire. What Jesus Christ would call us to is uncommon sexuality. And that means that in our sexuality, we express faithfulness to our spouse in the same way that God has expressed faithfulness to us. Absolutely faithful. And so we know, if you've read the Bible, I'm going to give you Cliff's notes here because we don't have time to go into all of it. The only proper conduct for the expression of our sexuality is within the context of a covenant marriage. Let me just say, that is uncommon in our culture today. Young people, you're going to see it glorified constantly in every television show you watch, in the music that you'll often listen to, in the encounters you have with people. They'll say, hey, it's really not all that important. It doesn't really matter. And yet God would call us as his people to be imitators of himself. And so with our sexuality, rather than going and doing what pleases us, we are sacrificial we give ourselves up, we deny ourselves, and we follow after Jesus Christ, and we only exercise our sexuality within the bounds that God has given us, within the context of a covenant marriage where we are absolutely faithful to our spouse in every single way. And so husbands, you have been called to be a one-woman man, absolutely faithful to her in everything. That means with your eyes 
and with your thoughts, with your words, and with your actions. You are absolutely faithful to your spouse in the same way that God was absolutely faithful to you. Even though sometimes we sin against God, even though we often don't worship in the way that we ought to worship, God remains faithful to us, and so we are faithful to our spouse in everything. Same way with you wives, in your, with your eyes, your thoughts, your words, your actions, your attitudes, you are absolutely faithful to your husbands in everything. Now, if you're single here today, this is a call to self-denial, isn't it? Whether you're young and you've never been married, or maybe you're getting a little bit older, maybe you've even been divorced. This call to uncommon conduct, to imitate Christ, this uncommon sexuality says, I'm going to be absolutely chaste. I'm going to walk in absolute purity. Sexual immorality will not even be named among me. I'm going to be faithful to Christ as he has been faithful to me. And let me just say, you will stand out among your peers. You will be unique in this world, but you will be setting an example worthy of imitation if you live in this way. It is uncommon. You see, within marriage, sex is a gift that we give. It's a way that we serve. It's a sacrifice that we offer. And it's not something that we instead indulge ourselves in seeking what we can get, but instead it's what we can give. And we set that pattern in our singleness, and we carry that pattern ultimately into our marriage. So we have uncommon service one to another as Jesus has served us. We have uncommon faithfulness in our sexuality, faithful to one another as Jesus Christ has been faithful to us. But Paul continues here in this list, and I'm going to go out of order. So if you're uh, some of those people that really get frustrated about that sort of thing, I just need you to know it's coming. I'm going to go out of order. Uh, the, The last word that Paul lists here is that of greed. Immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but we live in an extremely greedy culture. Y'all, we don't want enough. We just want more. And the minute we get more, we only want more. If, if you're like most people, you're probably experiencing a, a fairly good quality of life here in the United States. As a matter of fact, when you compare the way we live to the rest of the world, man, it's extraordinary how God has blessed us. And yet the most blessed people on earth are some of the least content people on the earth. And our lives can easily be consumed by greed and always wanting more, looking out not for the interest of others, but for the interest of me. Rather than seeing what our fellow man doesn't have, we often see what we don't have. We see what thing we want, and we go and we pursue that, and sometimes we step on other people to get there. And yet the Apostle Paul is saying, no, 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 imitators of Christ. As believers and followers of him, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you ought to walk as he walks. And so greed shouldn't even be named among you. But y'all, far more than just avoiding greed, if we're going to be imitators of Christ, we're going to be radically generous, aren't we? Do y'all know what God has given to us? And he's provided all that we get to enjoy. Like God created the heavens and the earth and everything on the earth, like everything that you've ever known and seen, it's a gift from God. Like the, the sunset and the, the rain and the, the weather, the, the, the hot days and the cold days, like all of it, these are gifts to us from God. And more than that, when we were separated from God, God gave his own son. Jesus went to the cross that, and died in our place, offering himself, sparing not even himself in giving to the world. And so as the people of God, as imitators of God, we ought to be radically generous people. One of the the things we call all of our members to do here, to strive toward, is to be a sacrificial giver. That means I give up something that I, I like, right? Something that I enjoy on behalf of someone that I love even more. It means we tell ourselves no rather consistently because we want to be able to say yes to other people. Because there are people who are in need, both here and around the world, and God has provided to us all, not only what we need, but also a lot of extra that we can meet the needs around us. And so because God has been, get, been so good to us, 
because he's been so generous to us, we should be a people uh, not only that avoid greed, but who walk in uncommon generosity. Y'all, sometimes we can like grow immune, if you will, to the need that's around us. And we'd buy into some of these lies that our culture tells us that, oh, they are where they are because of what they did. It's just their choices. They don't, you know, listen, if he would just work a little harder, if she would just work a little harder, if they'd just be a little more diligent, a little more responsible, then they, they could, you know, carry themselves. They wouldn't have to depend on other people. And to an extent, that's true. But to an extent, that's true of us, isn't it? That God has given to us far above and beyond what we ultimately deserve. That God has been good to us, generous to us, to us in ways that we could never merit. And so we as the people of God should be giving generously to the people around us, to the causes which would stir the heart of Christ. And ultimately when we do so, it's like a fragrant offering. It's an act of worship to God. It pleases his heart to see us be generous to our fellow man. Now the final thing that we're going to talk about here is that of integrity. In, in the middle word here is the word for impurity. Um, it basically, if you go back in the Greek, it can mean dirt. That in our lives, there shouldn't be dirt. There shouldn't be stuff back there that we kind of hide. That You know, we're all going to present something good on the surface, right? Like, I don't want you all to know all the, all the bad stuff, right? So I could stand up here and I could smile and put on a pretty face and, and you all wouldn't have to know about all that other stuff going on, right? We as the people of God have been called that there shouldn't even be impurity named among us. Like there shouldn't be any of this going on. There should be no dirt in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but every time the news comes on, uh, I have a tendency to want to listen because they're about to, to dish some dirt on somebody. There's a CEO. There's someone who's been a, a well-doer in society, and we're about to hear the real story of their life. Our, our society is obsessed with this. Like we like reality TV because we get to see what's behind the scenes in people's lives, right? You know an uncommon way to live? You know what it looks like to be an imitator of Christ? Is to instead, not, not to walk in impurity, but instead to live a life of integrity. Which means that what we present on the outside is consistent with what's ultimately going on behind the scenes in our life. That there's not a bunch of junk hidden back there that we're projecting one way and living another. But we live lives of integrity. And so just so that you can breathe for a minute, this doesn't mean we never fail. This doesn't mean we don't ever make mistakes or fall into sin. It means that we're quick to confess when we do. That before God and before our, our friends or our family, or our community, before our church, that we're quick to confess our sin. That we don't present perfection if that's not what's really going on in our lives. But instead, we'll be men and women of integrity. And we'll acknowledge our own failures, which causes us to be a little bit more humble, right? And a little more gracious toward other people who fail. But we live lives of uncommon integrity where there's not dirt hidden back there to people really knew the real story. They wouldn't love us or trust us or want to follow us. But instead, we live lives that are worthy of imitation, acknowledging that we're, we're sinful people apart from Christ, that we need him and we're striving toward his righteousness. And when we fail, we're going to call it out and admit it. And we're going to make amends. And we're going to you know, make our apologies. And then we're going to keep on following after Jesus Christ. So what God has called us to is to be imitators of God, that our conduct ought to stand out in the world, that we ought to be like Hosea, that we tell the story of the goodness of God with our lips and with our lives. Church, can you imagine with me in the culture that we live in, if today when we leave here and we go out into our city, if everyone in this church was a man or woman of uncommon service to our fellow man. The people knew, man, if you met one of those people that goes to cross community, one of those people who's a follower of Jesus, man, they're going to serve you like no one has ever served you. And I tell you what, those people who go to cross community, they, they call themselves Christians, they're followers of Jesus. When I see their life, they have this radical generosity about them. Like they're just going to give to other people. They're not living their lives for themselves. Like sometimes they'll even go without that other people could have. 
And can you imagine if we left this place and we were a people of uncommon sexuality, that we were absolutely faithful to our spouses and everything, and we weren't consumed by the things that consume this world, indulging our flesh, and we weren't addicted to pornography or whatever other thing we might get into, but we were absolutely faithful to our spouses in everything as God has been to us. And then imagine if we were a people of uncommon integrity, that people knew that what you see is what you get with those people. Man, they are striving after Christ. And if they make mistakes, they're quick to admit it. They don't hide it. They don't try to make themselves look better than they are. They're just humble people following after Jesus. Can you imagine the testimony that would be uttered in our community every single day, hundreds of times over? So the Apostle Paul, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, in the same way that God has loved you, in the same way that Jesus loved you and gave himself up for you, that we would love other people and give ourselves up for them. And just like Hosea, we would tell the story of the goodness of God with our lips, but also with our lives. If you're here today and you've never been reconciled to God, I'm not asking if you've been to church or prayed a prayer. If you've never been truly reconciled to God, you've never come to a place where you would trust in him to save you from your sins and to draw you into a relationship with him. If that's never happened, I want you to know in a few minutes we're going to have a time of invitation, and I'm going to invite you to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and respond to him and begin to follow him and walk in this uncommon kind of life. Jesus has been chasing after you. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And there's no person whose sin is too great. There's no person who's gone too far. Jesus desires to save you today. He's been chasing after you. He offered his life as a sacrifice for you. So if you don't know him, in a couple of minutes, we're going to have time of invitation. I want to invite you to come down here. And I would love to pray with you. And you feel, if you feel uncomfortable standing up in front of everyone, you can grab someone in the, in, the, in the row right next to you and just say, hey, would you tell me about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it means to be saved? If you're here today and you would call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, in the next few minutes we're going to have this time of response. And what I would want you to do is just begin to walk through these four areas in your life. Hey, Jesus, if I'm following after you, What would be different in my life? In the way that I serve people? My generosity toward others? In the way that I'm practicing my sexuality? What about my integrity? God, is there anything that needs to change? And I'm going to trust that you would change that. So I want to say a word of prayer for us, then we're going to have this time of response. Father, we desire to be a people who follows after you. And God, a people who speaks the story of the goodness of our God. We are like Gomer that we've been unfaithful to you in every way. God, there's not a sin on earth that hasn't been committed among this body. Lord, we've sinned in a thousand different ways. We've chased after other gods. We've given ourselves to idols, and yet you are a God who was completely faithful to us, who paid an extraordinary price to buy us back, to reconcile us to you. So, Lord, I pray that we would be that people that as you have done unto us, we would do unto others. Lord, would you use us to bring light into the darkness of our community, into the darkness of our homes, into the darkness of our workplaces? We as the people of God, may we shout of your goodness with both our lips and our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.